Hello, everyone, and welcome to what I think is a very much needed presentation about a global problem that seems to be barreling out of control. Uh, so they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So first, let's take a look at four pictures. So here are uh, some typical American children from 1970. And here is what many American children look like today. Um, and now let's juxtapose this. Uh, here are typical Taiwanese children from 1980. And here are some typical Taiwanese children today. So these parallels are very obvious, right? It's no secret that obesity has plagued American culture for decades now. But I was really shocked and concerned to see this trend uh, exporting itself and landing on the shores of the country that I now reside, which is Taiwan. So global obesity is an ever-increasing and concerning problem, and today I will focus mainly on childhood obesity trends in Taiwan, as, uh, as well as a three-step plan in how to protect our kids in any country from excessive weight gain and the physical and mental consequences that come with it. So I'm sure you're all thinking now, so why Taiwan? Why are you focusing on this small island? So I've been living in, and teaching in Taiwan for over 20 years. Uh, Taiwan is my home. I love the culture and the people here. Um, I feel like I am Taiwan's adopted son and uh, I want to contribute to improving the lives of the people around me. And uh, this is how I, I feel I can contribute and to give back to this culture that has given me so much over the years. So I've witnessed a, a great deal of Taiwan's development and shift from an agrarian society to an industrialized society. Uh, over the years, I've noticed Taiwan's embrace of Western culture and the pervasiveness of fast food joints as well as junk food, candy, and other Western exports that have slowly made their way into Taiwanese culture. Along with this shift to a more westernized society also came the detrimental byproducts of this way of life. So I, I noticed in my classes, since I teach um, English here in Taiwan, I noticed in some of my classes the students' waistlines getting bigger and bigger over the years. And many of my students and friends here uh, have started having the same health problems as my friends and family back in the States. Specifically, cardiovascular problems like elevated cholesterol and high blood pressure, as well as high fasting insulin levels and diabetes. Um, and I also noticed that Taiwanese children I encountered uh, on, on the streets or in, in my uh, um, other encounters, um, I, I noticed that uh, you know, they're, they're getting heavy, heavier and heavier as well. So, so I wanted to see um, if there was any science to back up my observations to see if Taiwan is indeed falling prey to the trappings of a westernized diet and sedentary lifestyle. It was my objective in this research to identify obesity trends as well as other advice on how we can combat uh, th this epidemic and, and save our children from uh, suffering the health consequences of overweight and uh, obesity. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, global obesity trends first. Um, so it's not a secret that global obesity has been steadily rising over the last 40 years. So according to the World Health Organization, the WHO, worldwide obesity has nearly tripled since 1975. Tripled since 1975. And 39 million children under the age of five were overweight or obese in 2020. And as well, over 340 million children and adolescents aged 5 to 19 were overweight or, or obese in 2016. So this epidemic is obviously spiraling out of control. And I wanted to um, find data that confirmed that this trend is also affecting Taiwan. And lo and behold, this study confirms my findings. Morbid obesity in Taiwan. Uh, so this specific study focuses on overweight and obesity trends in Taiwan from 1993 to 2014 and results found that prevalence of obesity and morbid obesity have sharply increased over these years, which is exactly what I've seen with my own eyes over the years of living and teaching in, in Taiwan for over 20 years. 
So now in, in Taiwan, overweight children are seen as cute. Um, cute nicknames like, you know, little fat or a little chubby uh, are routinely given to overweight children. Um, also, food in Taiwan is thought of as an expression of love. Um, mothers seeing their children eating voraciously feel as if they are, you know, showing their love for their children through an ab the abundance of food that is provided. Um, and the extra weight the kid is carrying is also, you know, a, a considered a symbol of that love. So in Taiwan, childhood obesity does not seem to be much of a concern, but we need to start being concerned about this right now. For one, childhood obesity is not harmless or benign. There are many disease risk factors that greatly increase with childhood obesity, as in this study. So childhood obesity has been linked to numerous medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, fatty liver disease, sleep apnea, which means you actually stop breathing when you're sleeping, asthma, high cholesterol, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. So if this, if this isn't enough, the, all these you know, physical problems that come with being overweight, if this isn't enough to, to slap that ice cream bar out of your, your child's hand, we'll take a look at this. You know, these kids uh, that are overweight and obese, they also suffer mentally and emotionally. So childhood obesity can, be pro can profoundly affect children's uh, physical health, social and emotional well-being, and self-esteem. Um, it's also associated with poor academic performance and a lower quality of life experienced by the child. Now, obesity is seen as one of the most stigmatizing and least socially acceptable conditions in childhood. You can all think about back when you were a kid and how, you know, obesity and, and being overweight was stigmatized and how, how kids are very cruel in teasing these, these, uh, these children. Um, so overweight and obese children are often teased, bullied, and uh, also face uh, other hardships including uh, negative stereotypes, discrimination, and social marginalization. Um, so no, you know, no parent wants their kid to suffer like this. So, so how do we protect our kids and ensure that they stay at a healthy body weight to avoid all of these pitfalls of being overweight? Well, you know, first we have to come to a, a consensus about what is considered an ideal body weight. So, so let's talk about that right now. So how do we define, define overweight and obesity? So again, let's go to the, uh, the uh, professionals here, the WHO, the World Health Organization. So according to the WHO, overweight and obesity are defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a health, uh, a risk to health. So a body mass index, a BMI, over 25 is considered overweight and over 30, a BMI over 30 is considered obese. So I'm sure most of us have heard of, of BMI, uh, but what is BMI really? Simply put, BMI is a measure that uses your height and your weight to work out if your weight is healthy. It's a very simple calculation. So, how do we calculate BMI? So here's how we calculate BMI. So BMI equals kilograms over, divided by meters squared, where kilograms is a person's weight in kilograms and uh, you know, meters squared is their height in meters squared. So if we were to calculate my BMI, uh, this is how we would do it. So I am 71 kilograms, don't make fun of my weight, everybody. So I'm 71 kilograms and I am uh, 1.72 meters tall or 172 centimeters tall. So let's calculate this. So it's 1.72 times 1.72, which equals 2.9584. And then we take 71, which is my weight, divide by that number, 2.9584, what do we get? We get 23.99 or about, about 24. So is this healthy? Uh, well, here, here are the ranges for body mass index. Okay, so below 18.5, you are in the underweight range. You're too thin, you need to gain weight. And between 18.5 and 24.9, you're in the healthy weight range. So am I healthy? I'm healthy. <laughs> 
barely holding on to the upper limit, right? I'm, I'm at uh, 24, so 24.9, I'm in the, health, in the healthy weight range. Okay, so between 25 and 29.9, you're in the overweight range. And between 30 and 39.9, you're in the obese range. And of course, we have different levels of uh, obesity. So if numbers in math is, you know, if these are not your things, don't fret. Um, we have a, you know, we have many websites that can calculate this for you. It's very easy. Um, the best one, just go to calculator.net and just type in your age, your height, and your weight, three things, and they'll calculate everything for you. It's that easy, and they have, you know, really cool graphs on there as well. Um, okay, so not difficult, right? So now we know what to shoot for to keep our kids at a healthy body weight. Um, so how do we do it? Well, what exactly causes and contributes to obesity? That's a tough question to answer, but we're gonna try to break it down. Let's take a look. So what causes obesity? I think most people know that people gain weight when they eat too much, right? I mean, calories in exceeds calories out. Pretty simple, you're gonna gain weight, right? But why are we consuming more calories now than 30 or 40 years ago? So to answer this question, we have to look at the evolution of our digestive systems. So first of all, evolutionarily, we were, we were born to eat. Um, throughout most of our human history, uh, humans have, we've existed in survival mode where we didn't know where our next meal was gonna come from. We had long periods of, of food scarcity. So we've been programmed with a powerful drive to eat as much as we can while we can and just store the calories we don't need right away on our bodies for later. That's why we store fat for you know, energy that we need later. But remember, we evolved over millions of years, a heck of a long time before we had McDonald's or KFC or Taco Bell. So what were we eating millions of years ago? Well, basically whatever we could find, right? We needed to find calories to survive, which was primarily the easiest food to find, whole plant food diet, including you know, copious amounts of um, green vegetables, tubers like sweet potatoes and taro, and as much fruit as we could possibly find. So of course we had the occasional animal meat, you know, animal meat thrown in there when it was available, but examination of fossilized feces from our ancient ancestors confirms that our diet was mostly a whole plant food diet. So now our, our ancient ancestors who ate more in the moment were, able, were, were better able to store you know, more fat for the future and uh, they, might be, they might better survive um, future food shortages so they can pass along their genes. Now, generation after generation, millennia after millennia, those with the lesser appetites probably died out while those who gorged themselves, ate a lot, could have selectively lived long enough to pass on this genetic trait to eat more and store more calories. That may be how we evolved into such you know, voracious calorie conserving machines. Uh, but remember, our ancestors were eating natural, nutrient-rich, calorie-dilute plant foods. So take this evolutionary you know, propensity to, to gorge and eat as many calories as possible, and now we put this in the modern environment of overabundant, calorie-rich food, and what do we get? Uh, we get continuous access intake of calories, which leads to more and more weight gain. There's nothing wrong with our bodies. We're, we're not getting fat for no reason, right? We, our bodies have been evolutionarily programmed to store as much fat for impending food shortages. But now, these food shortages never come. Instead, of the, instead, it's the constant stream of calories, calories, and more calories in the form of you know, our normal foods, greasy hot dogs, hamburgers, and pizza, as well as other junk food. So what do you think our ancient ancestors would look like if we plop them down today in today's environment of uh, this never-ending stream of calories and processed foods? Probably something like this. Now, the, this propensity to seek out the most calorie-rich foods 
you know, bears out in the science as well. Take a look at these two studies. Um, so first study, trends in consumption of ultra-processed foods among U.S. youths. youths. So study after study uh, shows that diets are clearly shifting away from our natural, whole, calorie dilute, unprocessed foods and barreling headfirst into diets laden with ultra-processed and processed foods. So from 1998 to 2018, U.S. children's consumption of ultra-processed foods increased from 61.4% of the total calories to 67%. 67% of total calories come from ultra-processed foods. Now, conversely, the consumption of whole unprocessed foods that, we, that our ancient ancestors ate, fruits and vegetables, decreased from 28.8 to 23.5%. It's just crazy. Um, so this trend, it's no different for adults. Um, here's another study. Take a look at this one. From 2001 to 2018, the consumption of ultra-processed foods increased among all U.S. adults from 53.5 to 57 percent. So again, our bodies are only reacting according to the evolutionary programming. We're seeking out and we're consuming the most calorie-dense foods possible. So obesity could simply be the result of a mismatch between our modern environment and the environment in which we evolved. So obviously, you know, the foods that we put in our mouth, it's the main focus on combating obesity, right? Our diet is number one, the thing we have to focus on the most. But are there other factors? Well, there's a lot that contribute to obesity. Let's focus on the three main ones, right? So again, people gain weight when calories in exceed calories out. So how do we increase calories out? Move that body, right? We've got to exercise. Okay, so take a look at this. Contribution of a sedentary lifestyle and inactivity to the etiology of overweight and obesity, right? So studies clearly show that low levels of physical activity are also associated with an increased risk of weight gain and obesity. So our bodies are machines, you know, we're meant to move and to be active. So it's of utmost importance that we encourage our kids to be active and to get outside and have fun, right? Move their bodies around. Okay, we'll talk about what kind of exercise we should do later, all right? Okay, so third, third pillar in fighting obesity. Remember, we're focusing on three, the three main pillars here. So the third pillar in fighting obesity is sleep quality. So several laboratory and epidemiological studies have found that short sleep duration and poor sleep quality as a risk factor for development of obesity. So combating obesity relies on three main factors. Let's think of these three factors like a tree. So the trunk, the main pillar in the fight of obesity is diet. Um, we need to uh, eat more in tune with the diet that we evolved with. We need to bring our bodies back in tune with our natural diet. So now this, this tree has two branches as well, uh, which contribute to our fight in ob in, against obesity. These two branches are exercise and sleep. So what diet? How much exercise and how much sleep? Here we go. Plan for combating obesity. So what do most people do when they want to lose weight? They go on a diet, right? They start counting calories and they do some version of a calorie restricted diet. This is a big mistake. Why is this a mistake? Take a look at these studies. So dietary adherence to long-term controlled feeding in a calorie restriction study in overweight men and women. Okay, so it's very clear from the science that calorie restricted diets do not work. Study after study show that it's very hard for people to stick to calorie restricted diets. When put to the test, calorie restricted diets have very low adherence with 40% of the participants failing to stick to the diet when, they, when monitored for only six months. 89% of failed adherence was attributed to cravings, cravings. Now, this is when you know, they were being monitored. So when they're let back out into the real world, how many of those on a diet would fail to stick to that diet? I think we, 
we can all figure it out, right? With all the junk food temptation waiting for them, it's not hard to guess how many people are going to fail here. So another study shows the same result. 32% of participants on a calorie-restricted calorie diet reported to rarely follow their diet or just abandon the diet altogether when they're left to their own devices. So why don't diets work? So remember, our digestive systems have evolved to eat the diet of our ancient ancestors, which was predominantly calorie dilute plant foods. In fact, you know, one solid theory for the rising level of obesity is that the body's mechanisms for controlling appetite evolved to match ancestral diets with more low energy plant foods. You know, this makes total sense when we think about this evolutionarily, like we just mentioned. Our digestive systems have evolved over millions of years to eat these whole plant foods, not the calorie rich processed and junk foods that is, you know, that are so prevalent now. So now our, let's take a look at our stomachs and how our digestive systems have evolved very quickly, right? Um, so our stomachs have these stretch receptors that when we activate them, the, these receptors, they, the, the stomach will, when the receptors are stretched, the stomach sends a signal to the brain and tells the body that we're full and we should stop eating, right? Um, so when enough food enters our stomach, it stretches the stomach, which is the activator for the satiety signal to the brain. So, so let's take a look at this. So this is what 500 calories looks like inside of your stomach. 500 calories of oil is the first one, and then the next one is 500 calories of cheese, 500 calories of meat, 500 calories of grains and beans, and finally, 500 calories of vegetables. So take a guess here. Which one is going to stretch that stomach and give that signal to your body that we should stop eating? Only the beans and greens and the vegetables. So if we count and restrict our calories, but, we, but we're still eating processed, you know, this processed calorie-heavy diet, we're setting ourselves up for failure. We will never get that satiety signal, and we will eventually give in to our cravings. Just like the science said, 89% of people failed on their diet because of cravings, right? Now, only if there was a study showing that you know, following a whole foods, plant-based diet like our ancestors re resulted in sustained weight loss over time. And there is a study like this. Enter the broad study. So this was a randomized six-month control study to see what effect a whole foods, plant-based diet had on weight loss in obese participants. So a whole foods, plant-based diet given to the subjects uh, ad libitum. Ad libitum. So this means that participants were advised to eat until they were satiated. They could eat as much as they want. There were no restrictions placed on how much food they could eat. And what were the results? They achieved greater weight loss at six months and 12 months than any other trial that does not limit energy intake or mandate regular exercise. This is truly groundbreaking in the fact that the participants uh, the participant adherence was was very high even six months after the trial ended participants were able to maintain that weight loss and stick to the diet so the science clearly shows that eating a whole foods plant-based diet like our ancestors did many many years ago is the way to go now you know I can hear this uproar already from the parents like, how am I gonna get my children to eat fruit and vegetables they all want to eat junk food right they only want to eat processed food so there are truly some godsend websites out there that provide amazing and delicious whole food plant-based recipes that your kids will love. So we have, here are just you know, three of the, of, the, of the best ones. Forks over knives, number one. Plant Strong, number two. And Center for Nutrition Studies, number three. I mean, just look at these mouth-watering whole food plant-based recipes, right? Uh, I've personally tried many of these recipes from these websites and they are all super tasty and satisfying, right? And you can eat as much as you want, no diet, right? Okay, <clears throat> so now that we covered diet, right? Second pillar of our anti-obesity tree, how much exercise should we do? Exercise, right? So the, so the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, they recommend that children and adolescents aged uh, 6 through 17 need to be active for about 60 minutes a day. So what kind of exercise should we do? 
you know, that's easy to answer. The type of exercise that you enjoy and gets your kids outside and active. So try to set aside, uh, you know, 60 minutes per day to be active with your kids. Just do something enjoyable. You know, some kids like badminton. Some people like, some kids like playing in the park. You know, even freestyle dancing or hide and seek, you know, these are all fun ways to incorporate exercise into your lives. Just make it fun, make it a routine, and make it bonding time for your family. All right, that's the most important thing. So finally, finally, let's talk about sleep. How much sleep should we get? So again, turn to the professionals, National Sleep Foundation. So according to the National Sleep Foundation, here is a quick rundown of how much sleep your child should get. Okay, so if your kid is one to 12 months old, 14 to 15 hours per day, one to three years old, 12 to 14 hours per day, three to six years old, 10 to 12 hours per day, seven to 12 years old, 10 to 11 hours per day, and teenagers, 12 to 18 years old, eight to nine hours per day. And then, you know, if you're above 18 to 65 years old, seven to nine hours per day. Okay, pretty simple, right? Okay, so remember, sleep hygiene is also, uh, you know, very important. A good sleep routine is important. Try to get kids to uh, turn off all screens and electric devices about an hour before bedtime. Focus on relaxing activities at night, like reading, listening to soft music. Um, make sure your kid's bedroom is quiet and dark at night to allow for this deep, you know, uh, really excellent sleep. Okay, so in summary, let's think of this anti-obesity plan, like we said before, as a tree with three branches. Um, now, of course, the biggest branch is our diet, and the other two smaller branches are, being, are exercise and sleep, right? So exercise, 60 minutes a day. Sleep, we just mentioned it. And remember, diet, whole food, plant-based diet. So, you know, let's really work together to get our kids off on the right track for a healthy and successful life. And I think that's, uh, that's about it. So thanks for watching, everybody. Um, if anyone has any questions on health, nutrition, lifestyle, or how to start a healthy diet, you know, feel free to contact me at kaisnutrition at gmail.com. Everyone take care. Stay healthy. Have a great day. See you guys next time.